being here. Um, my name is Natasha Durovichova, and uh, I'm here to welcome you to a panel which is the ingenious title, Closing Chapters, Opening Attachments, The Near Future of the Book. Um, as you know, today is the uh, 23rd of April, which is a date that the UNESCO has picked for a, uh, as a, as a day of the book, and rightly so has attached the question of, has attached the term, the day of copyright, uh, to that date. It's a symbolic date for world literature. Uh, this is the year when 1616 Cervantes, Shakespeare, and Inca de Vega all died. <laughs> Sad, but <laughs> clearly marked day. It's also the date of birth, uh, birth and death of other prominent authors, such as Drawn, Laxas, Nabokov, and uh, Vallejo, and so it's a natural choice for UNESCO to have picked, for, picked this day. But uh, to celebrate the day of the book and also to celebrate reading. But of course, as we know, book, the book has since 1616 mutated vastly into an object that no longer is an inert, friendly um, thing that accompanies us where we go or rests quietly on our shelf, but rather has become a mutable, highly mutable object, uh, really broken down into a series of ones and zeros, metamorphosed and and uh, received on a variety of different objects in a variety of different spaces, in a variety of different circumstances. And the question of how to negotiate the transition from the stable to the ephemeral and to the constantly trans transforming and, metam and metamorphosing is the, is the chief topic of today's conversation. Uh, the four panelists that will help us uh, walk our way through this change are going to be in slightly different order than what you have on your handout. We're going to begin with uh, uh, Green Martin, who, uh, Granny Martin, who is the Deputy General Counsel for Research and Regulatory Legal Services at the University of Iowa. She's the person who helps us negotiate the various uh, complicated, turbulent waters of copyright and intellectual property as we work at the university. Uh, following her will be Jim McCoy, who is the new, uh, new head of the University of Iowa Press. Uh, he has been with the press for a couple of years before that as an assistant director in sales, uh, of, a sales and marketing director, but he's also spent 10 years before that uh, at the University of Chicago Press, and, pre and he's currently serving as the chair of the marketing committee for the Association of American University Presses. Following that will be Russell Valentino. He's a professor of comparative literature and of translation studies, uh, but he is also here wearing his hat as the uh, co-director of a small independent press, the Autumn Hill Books, and also as the editor of a distinguished literary journal, uh, the Iowa Review, and both of these publications are navigating and finding their way between their existence as paper, uh, uh, paper uh, printouts and as as the more ephemeral words in space uh, that, that reach us in a variety of media. And f uh, last of our discussions is Kimberly McLeod. Uh, he's an associate professor in the Communication Studies Department uh, with a s vast array of expertise, expertise in this more ephemeral part of the, uh, of the, the book products. He is, uh, he is the author of a book called Freedom of Expression, Resistance and Oppression, the Age of Intellectual Property. Uh, also with Peter DiCola, a law professor at Northwestern of Creative License, the Law and Culture of Digital Sampling, and the co-editor of the anthology with Rudy Kunsley of Cutting Across Media, Interventionist Collage, Appropriation Art and Copyright Law, as well as two films on the nature, mutable nature of copyright. They will go in that sequence. Uh, 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 Mrs. Martin, Mr. McCoy, uh, Russell Valentino, and Kim McLeod, and then we will open it for discussion and then for questions from audiences. Please help me welcome our panelists. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Grania Martin um, from the University of Iowa's General Counsel's Office, and being a lawyer, I need to say, a disclaimer, um, which is that nothing that I'm going to say is, is uh, representative of the university's perspective on these questions. When Chris first asked me to be part of this panel, um, he asked, he told me it was World Book Day and come and talk about copyright, and I thought, I was a little puzzled about that, frankly, because I'm a person who, I'm a person who works with people who are trying to use copyrighted materials and so that's my perspective on this, and I wasn't exactly sure what perspective we were being asked to take here. So I went looking, and I found uh, last year's 
statement from the Director General of UNESCO about the copyright aspect of today, and she said this, in light of the emergence of new forms of books, of changes in the design, production, and access to contents of books, it is urgent to recall that there can be no book development without respect for copyright. This is particularly the case at a time when digitization <coughs> further exposes books to risks of illicit use. So that pretty much gave me the perspective uh, of World Copyright Day, which is that it was from the perspective of those who hold copyrights. Um, so I started thinking about this question from that perspective and uh, asking myself, what is the near future of the book from that perspective? And I thought, it looks pretty promising because here you have a number of things in favor of content holders. You have Congress, which has repeatedly over the years um, extended the term of copyright protection. Originally, copyright protection was for 14 years plus a possible additional 14 years on renewal. Now, over the years, it has come to be basically the lifetime of the creator plus an additional 70 years. And this last, last time that it was extended, it was done to cover copyright works that were in copyright at the time, which meant that, among other things, Walt Disney was able to extend the term of copyright protection for Mickey Mouse. Um, Congress has also served the interest of the content owners by prohibiting attempts, by passing legislation that prohibits attempts to circumvent digital rights management technologies that are used by content owners to try to control access to copyright works. And there specifically I'm talking about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, after years of seeing uh, efforts by the recording industry to control peer-to-peer -peer downloading in the music context, we're now seeing book publishers being fully engaged in suing um, people who want to use their works and protecting their own copyrights. For example, they have, there are two cases right now that are pretty prominent in the news. They have sued Google. Um, Google, as you know, has, has uh, a project going to um, digitize the, the holdings of, of a number of academic and research libraries to digitize those contents and make them available for search purposes. And publishers have sued Google over that activity because uh, Google has essentially um, taken some of the exclusive rights of copyright holders without express permission. Publishers have also sued a prominent academic research institution, not ours, I'm happy to say, for alleged copyright infringement by its faculty relating to the faculty's use of copyrighted materials in, in their e-reserve system, um, which is essentially uh, an attack on the doctrine of fair use, as I see it. Um, another thing that is in favor of um, of the future, of a robust future of the book as it pertains to copyright is that licenses have to, or libraries have to pay licenses to, um, for ebooks and comply with the terms of those licenses with respect to access so that in some sense can restrict, restrict the access of users of those materials. So in general the buzzword of the day is internet privacy and a healthy respect for copyright seems to be assured. Um, but then I thought, wait a minute. I'm a lawyer who works with people who are trying to use copyrighted materials. And so I know that there's another side to this issue. And I started thinking about that side. So from that perspective, from the perspective of users of copyrighted materials, things look a little bit different. If we go back to the beginning and think about how we came to have copyright, in the protection, copyright protection in the first place, we go back to the Constitution. And there, the framers of the Constitution gave Congress the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors um, the right to their respective writings. So that was always, from the beginning, meant to be a balance it was a balance that allowed, on the one side, the copyright owner 
to exercise exclusive rights to the work. Um, and as Thomas Jefferson called that, he, in his view, that was a monopoly. But that was only for a limited period of time with the understanding that the limitation was imposed for the good of the public and the further understanding that those works would eventually end up in the public domain for all of us to use. So this balance was created to encourage creativity and to compensate creativity on the one hand, at the same time acknowledging that this creative was, creativity was for the public, for the public good. Um, so, if you think about the perspective of users of copyright, this balance seems wildly off balance at this point in our history. There are, and, and I think Kimbrough is going to talk more about this, there are challenges to fair use that really, in, in the view of some people, um, threaten to kill the concept of fair use. The, the issue, or the concept of the public domain is under attack from these continued extensions of copyright protection, the term of copyright protection. The amount of, of funding, or the amount of uh, lobbying that's going on in Congress and has been going on over the years, and the funding that supports those lobbying efforts um, is staggering when you think about it. And the reason, if you think about it, is not that um, much of a mystery when you consider that, that copyrights are actually held in many cases by companies rather than by individual authors. So that's the perspective of the users of copyright holders and so we've got two very different perspectives here and a balance that depending on which side you're on is, is either off or not. So enter into this fray the whole Google projects or the Google book projects Google Books Project and the settlement that was recently rejected in that case. Google had worked with the publishers that uh, was suing it, were suing it to settle the lawsuit on terms that would have allowed Google to continue to scan the works of the libraries and make them av available in a search database so that you could for works that were still under copyright protection, you could see parts of the text. And this whole scheme was to operate without the express permission of copyright holders. You had to, if you owned the copyright to a book that Google was proposing to digitize, you had to opt out of this project rather than opt in, which turns the whole concept of copyright permission on its head um, so the court that rejected this settlement seemed to think that, that this was a really significant redirection of the current copyright law um, and that this was the domain of Congress to do rather than the domain of Google and that Google shouldn't be allowed to exercise these rights even if Congress allowed it to the exclusion of others. So that's sort of where we are right now in terms of the copyright world and the balance that we started out with. And that leaves us with some questions, such as, should we do something to change our current copyright system? And if so, what should we do? And obviously that's not an easy question because we've got two very different perspectives on this. Um, but one thing that we really urgently need to answer is what should we do about orphan works, those works whose copyright owners cannot be located, but people still need to use those works. And another question that comes to mind related to the Google settlement, would the publisher and author community react <coughs> any better to a public digital library proposal than it has acted to the Google pro project proposal? So those are some questions that I thought we might toss around a little bit. and. Uh, see what Jim has to add to this. All right. Uh, well, I definitely come from, to this from a publisher's perspective. And uh, I'd like to address, first of all, some basic economic issues. And as we all know, uh, economics and the law are, are highly intertwined when it comes to this um, particular issue of copyright and, and licensing and the attendant issues. Um, and although I'm occasionally accused of being alarmist, uh, 
I'm not a Luddite. I, I should say that University of Iowa Press for a small press has gone boldly into that uh, digital future and, and uh, we're up and running with most of the major ebook vendors. I signed off on two new ebook contracts just this week. Uh, so we welcome uh, uh, the dissemination, the digital dissemination of scholarship um, and, and see it as a, as a really great new avenue um, to help scholars, to help publishers. Uh, but I do want to raise a few topics, um, a few issues that are surrounded about the new ebook world and ebook economy. And so the first thing to understand about the ebook industry that it's currently being run by people who are not traditional publishing partners, what we call partners. Um, it's being run by IT companies, uh, Sony, Google, uh, Apple, Amazon. These are different relationships than we've had in the past. Uh, there are a few traditional people, Barnes & Noble springs to mind, but uh, by and large, what these companies are really out to do <coughs> is different from what we're, we're traditionally have set forth to do. Uh, we're out there to sell books and, and to help provide building blocks for scholars. Uh, and their agenda is yeah, we want to make some money from books, but we also want to grab your information and find out more about you. We want to sell you other products through ads, uh, and we want to create a, a very hospitable digital marketplace, uh, not just for books, but for other things. And I'm, I welcome a hospitable marketplace, but uh, what I mean by that is a lot of online digital media comes with certain expectations, certain price expectations not just accessibility. Uh, we live in a world of 299 apps and 99 cent uh, music file downloads, and now we live in a world of 999 uh, uh, price points for books. Uh, and this has really grown up, this has been forced upon publishers by the vendors. Amazon, Google, some other prominent vendors, Barnes & Noble. Uh, unfortunately, they never bothered to ask the publishers about their financial consideration when heading into this price point. And there are certain expectations, as I said, that have been growing out there in the consumer market, but I, I think they're based only on, uh, on what the vendors have put forth, not really on the traditional uh, uh, considerations of a publisher. And, and if you have uh, an economy of scale for a book, such as a bestseller, something that's going to sell 20, 30,000 copies even, uh, the, the, this e-model $99, uh, $99 uh, price point works, <coughs> but most books are not bestsellers, certainly not most books that university presses do. Uh, publish. And the concept that a book is cheaper to produce and therefore should be priced cheaper because you don't print it is really false. Uh, in fact, 70 to 80 percent of the investment that a publisher makes in a book happens uh, well outside of its physical printing. Um, editing costs money. Copy editing, proofreading, typesetting, design, marketing. Uh, and in the case of ebooks, the conversion cost from these traditional elements to an ebook and we're converting to multiple platforms. For instance, uh, a rough range, a, a typical two to three hundred page book cost two to three hundred dollars to convert and we have to convert it to multiple um, platforms. Well that almost offsets the printing cost you would be getting into for an average print run. Um, so all these things cost a great deal of money and at the end of the day $9.99 as compared to $17 isn't really a corollary that works for publishers. And uh, if you really want information that has been properly vetted and valued, there's a lot of ways to it, and, and publishing is one way to it. We add a lot of value uh, to that content. Um, and for that reason, I always say information isn't free. We can talk about it being free. It's not. Um, and this false economy that's springing up around ebooks, I think, is really leading into some legal issues that we'll hear a lot about in the next four or five years. Um, because of the decreased margins and revenues that ebooks uh, are leading to for publishers, I think that 
Mm -hmm. The licensing spawn from intellectual property in scholarly publishing will lead to tighter restrictions and more aggressive attempts by publishers to create some kind of revenue streams, hopefully larger revenue streams, through rights and permissions requests. Uh, I think, and I'm not saying this is a good thing, I, I think this is a natural permutation of where we're headed. Um, this is very similar to what happened in the museum industry about 15 to 20 years ago when they no longer could drive what they had been deriving from attendance. They began to find other revenue streams and invent all sorts of rights and permissions uh, issues around images. Um, uh, they began charging for images that they didn't even, that they didn't even control the copyright of. Uh, uh, the courts have since struck it down, but they would charge for a copy of a copy of a famous image. Um, and I see the publishers had it towards the same direction. They're going to, particularly the larger presses and the larger publishing presses, uh, they will figure out, uh, I meant scholarly publishing presses, will figure out which nuggets of information really have intellectual value, which ones are being, which ones have more citation value, which ones are being used uh, extensively for courses, and they will charge a premium for it. Um, before we've been pretty naive about how we've gone about this, but I, I do see this as developing, and I, I, as I said, I'm not sure this is a good thing. I, I think it's inevitable, but I, I think it does hamper um, a lot of what's good about um, uh, the concept of, of, of copyright. I, I think it's going to further restrict licensing and, and uh, if you're a young scholar and you're trying to write your dissertation and you have to go out, I, I should mention that these permissions, when you go out to seek them, they're on the author. You have to pay for them. No publisher uh, is going to pay for them. It's too expensive. <laughs> and if it's expensive for the publisher, it's even more expensive for you as the author. So if you're a young scholar and you're out there writing your dissertation, God forbid, an a art history dissertation, okay. um, that financial responsibility is on you, and it's already difficult. It's going to become more difficult, I think. I, I think you will see a lot of um, discussion in the courts about uh, uh, price collusion and um, discount collusion and all these other uh, things that we deal with in the background. And keep in mind that most of what we're dealing with now is really in the, the domestic trading marketplace. Um, and I, uh, I, th I think Kimberly's going to discuss this, but once we extend into the international marketplace, um, I think all bets are off, uh, both in terms of copyright and fair use and what we've done in the past and how we go forward. I mean, uh, I, I think that it's going to become <coughs> extremely confusing, and, and very few university presses, at least, will have the ability to administrate um, what they need to legally. Uh, in negotiating this marketplace, and it will really be an act of good faith as we extend it into those marketplaces that we're not being sued left and right. Um, thirdly, agency plans, which I just mentioned, which are being adopted by big six publishers, basically are a business model that are an attempt to control pricing, this 999 price structure that's out there. It's an attempt to move that into a more reasonable um, uh, price, but the way most of these are written and uh, places like Apple will only allow you into their iBook store if you're on an agency plan, these are really licensing plans, not, not sales plans. So when I go to, to sell books to Jan Weissmiller at Prairie Lights, that's what I'm doing. I'm selling her a book. Um, when, if I were on an agency plan and I went to Apple, I would be licensing their uh, the book. They would be a way station. And that brings up issues of um, how authors are, are remunerated. Um, and they're no longer working on royalties, they're working on licensing fees, which are much, much heftier. Um, typically it's a 50-50 split as opposed to maybe a 10 to 15 percent royalty. Um, all this is, is currently being adjudicated. I think there was a major case last fall Kimber, do you know about this with m and uh, where it was determined that this was actually a licensing model and that the, the, uh, his publisher and, and the uh, uh, people who were selling the, the music files owed him 50%, not the typical 
he was probably getting 20, 25% royalty. That's quite an investment. Uh, no one's opposed to it, but we need to know that that's going to be the situation up front because it does play havoc with, uh, um, with your pricing models. And, and then if you have to go back and remunerate the authors at a later point, it, it can be very devastating for a publisher. So these are some of the issues uh, I bring to the table and I'd be happy to discuss. And uh, again, we, we're really looking forward to the, the digital world and, and what it can mean for uh, new avenues for scholarship, but, but it also comes with thorns that I think most people are not aware of at this point. So with that, I pass it on to... I think it's my turn. Russell. So uh, I'm not going to give any uh, policy uh, analysis, but I'm, I'm just going to, I think, uh, give a bunch of cases and, and put a plus or a minus next to them as I go. What seems to me a plus for electronic publishing slash the way copyright is set up um, or uh, a minus uh, for those same things. So first of all, uh, last summer I was in um, uh, the Adriatic area and I was uh, visiting a publisher in the Croatian city of Rijeka, which is about 250,000 people. It's a niche publisher. I wanted to see what they were doing. They publish mostly for the Italian minority in that area, so they have a, a stable readership, but not a large readership. And they started complaining to me about the fact that they, they publish uh, just on the other side of the Adriatic from Italy, they publish books that would be interesting to Italians, but their distribution in Italy is almost non-existent because it's too expensive. They're outside of the European Union in Croatia, and they're in the European Union in, in, um, in Italy, and uh, they wanted to, you know, 60 million people over there, and they want to have access to that market. I uh, showed them my Kindle, <laughs> which they had never heard of or seen before. This was a year and a half ago. And I think that's a really good example of an electronic model, electronic publishing op opportunity that could help them a lot. Um, it's a distribution problem that they have. And so having their text somehow available, doesn't have to be through Amazon, obviously somehow available electronically um, could really help them out in terms of their market. Example two, so that's a plus. Example two. Uh, Marvin Bell wrote me about six weeks ago to ask why one of his poems, previously published in the Iowa Review, was available at a third-party website for $2.99. And I had absolutely no idea. Uh, we did track it down. It was uh, probably ProQuest. Some of you have used ProQuest or JSTOR or EBSCO or Wilson. These are library subscription services that buy the whole issue and then they make it available to subscribing libraries. But there's a tiny little clause in the old agreement that was signed with ProQuest 15 years ago before we knew what was really going to be happening with electronic publishing uh, that allows them to sell to third parties, to break off pieces and sell to third parties, and then the third parties are selling for money. And so we asked them if they would stop, and they ignored our request. And the uh, office of the, uh, the uh, University of Iowa Office of General Counsel sent them a revised contract uh, to prevent them from doing this. And so far, they have ignored the revised contract. And we can't get out of this contract. It has another several years on it. Um, so this is a definite minus. Um, that means anything that they have digitized from the Iowa the 41 years now of the Iowa Review back issues they can sell to third parties, um, and, and we apparently can't do anything about it. Definite minus. Um, third example, um, and I suppose this dovetails with uh, Grania's second point. Um, when uh, Boris Pasternak, a Russian author, was thinking that maybe conditions in the Soviet Union had loosened up enough uh, during the, this is during the Khrushchev thaw, uh, for him to publish this novel that he'd been working on, uh, he submitted it to the Soviet publishers, and he also submitted it to, he sent it abroad to an Italian publisher, thinking he would do both at the same time. He would publish it in the Soviet Union, he'd publish it abroad. And the answer came back from the Soviet authorities, pretty vehement answer, no, you're not going to publish this thing. And so he asked for the manuscript back from the Italian publisher, and they said, 
uh, no. <laughs> they kept it. And of course, he was inside the Soviet Union, and he couldn't do much about it. They published it. And very quickly, it was translated into several different languages, actually about 10, spread around the world. This is the novel you know as Dr. Zhivago. And it became a Cold War classic with the movie and all a few years later. Um, the problem is that it was done very quickly. It was, it was a big international Cold War case. So the translation is just OK. It's not a fantastic translation. But it's the only one that was available for the next 50 years because it's under copyright. The Italian publisher owns the copyright to the text. Uh, and they were making enough money, apparently, off of that one book that they didn't need a new translation. It wasn't until last year that they let um, Richard Pevere and Larissa Valachonsky do a new translation. And I think they let them do the translation. They have had plenty of other people ask to do one, people who are certainly capable and would have done a, a very good job. They let them do it, I suspect, because they are a big enough deal that a new translation by this new pair would attract more interest and sell more copies of the book. So it's finally in their interest to allow a new translation. But for 50 years, you had a sort of OK translation that I would teach in class and students would say, why is this, such a great, why is this considered such a great book? And I would say, well, this part really could be translated better, and that part over there could be translated better. Just not an ideal situation. Definitely, I would say that's a, that's a negative. Um, and not really a separate point. I look back to a period uh, another 50 years before that, during uh, high modernism, when uh, people didn't really observe copyright very much. And uh, there certainly weren't the restriction that, uh, restrictions on it we have today. And the resulting, I, would, I think there, there is a causal relationship here, the resulting vibrancy and exchange of culture at that time is something that we're still living off of today. That modernist period, period was extremely rich and, and just wild in terms of the, the artistic experimentation, the things that were going on. People were translating things back and forth. They didn't care about copyright. They were probably doing illegal things also. Uh, and that's actually where you find a lot of the most interesting ha stuff happening today. I'm sure Kim is going to talk about that. A um, couple other, so that's a, that's, a, that's a plus for no copyright or a plus for loosening of copyright restrictions in terms of cultural exchange um, and the exchange of ideas, forms of art, and so on. Um, folk translations are a phenomenon that you find especially with uh, big name authors who have a cult following, more than a cult following, who have a fan base. So uh, you find this happens with uh, oh, um, J.K. Rowling books, uh, Harry Potter. The latest Harry Potter gets, gets uh, released, and it's going to be translated into multiple languages all around the world. But the fans, are, they're hungry. And so they start doing their own. And you find a website that where somebody says, I just translated this first chapter of the latest Harry Potter novel, and somebody else says, oh, I just did the second one. Let's add them together. And then somebody does the third one, and you've got the whole thing up there, and J.K. Rowling's lawyers go after them. And they will shut that down. It's happened several times, not just with her. I mean, any, any popular book where you're going to have a real interesting cultural exchange, it seems to me, happening, and some some alternatives to translation issues that wouldn't necessarily come out of a mainstream industrial publisher, um, they'll be shut down. And, and that's a, a, bad, a bad consequence, it seems to me. What makes Google Translate possible? It's not a translation machine. It's a, it's a bunch of digitized texts. It's a huge database. It's a whole bunch of authors who, did tra who translated that stuff earlier. So when you put in a phrase, it looks for that phrase among all the huge number of titles that it has in there already, and it finds that somebody else translated it some other time, like this, and like this, and like this. That's pretty cool, <laughs> that you're able to find all that work. Of course, it's based on somebody's work. Somebody did that. So I can't say if that's good or bad. I don't know. It's just really great that it's available, but it's awful that the people who did actually that work are, are not going to get noticed at all. It's, they are hidden in that system. And I guess we will segue for that. Uh, yeah, and I have some other examples, but there'll be pluses or minuses in the same way. Next. Hi, I'm Cloud. Um, 
Yeah. Speaking of modernists, uh, Ezra Pound actually proposed in the teens uh, his own alternative copyright model, um, one in which it basically it was based on a compulsory license model, essentially. Uh, he was concerned, and a compulsory license basically refers to, like, in the world of music, for instance, you can cover someone else's song. Uh, I can cover a Beatles song without having to go to Paul McCartney to ask for permission. Um, and uh, Congress sets the price point, so I don't have to negotiate. That's the basic idea of a compulsory license. It makes it, it, it creates less friction-filled transactions. And Ezra Pound wanted to um, uh, essentially do the same thing to make uh, translations possible. So uh, that's, it's a really interesting case, but I, I, I couldn't help, uh, I, I'm not gonna go into it, but I couldn't help it mention it since you talked about modernism. Um, that, I'm gonna just really quickly wrap things up with uh, just three subjects that are interconnected. Fair use, content licensing, licensing and publishing contracts. So first with fair use, uh, uh, we had already discussed fair use and it's that which makes it possible for me to teach in a classroom and teach media studies classes and show clips from films or music videos and not have to ask for permission, go through Vivendi Universal and track down the, the rights clearance person. And the same is true in, in academic publishing. But the problem is, is uh, that most academic publishers and trade publishers for that matter have wildly inconsistent Internal, internal policies regarding fair use. So you can go, Duke University Press, for instance, is really good with fair use. I've published with them before, and uh, uh, they give me a lot of elbow room to basically, for instance, quote from song lyrics. Um, but, uh, you know, I get, well, just this week, almost every week, I get emails from scholars, especially scholars of popular music who, you know, want to publish, or who are in the process of publishing their book, and suddenly they found you know, that they're gonna have to gut part of their book uh, because, and their analyses, uh, because they can't quote from copyrighted material or their publisher isn't letting them. Uh, so a lot of publishers will have a, you know, for instance, no more, don't publish anything more than two lines of a poem or a song is not fair use and you have to go to the copyright owner. So anyway, this, create, this wreaks havoc on scholarship, especially uh, media-related scholarship or any sort of scholarship that's, um, that whose subject, whose object is still under copyright. In fact, modernist scholars, scholars of um, modernism have all sorts of problems with um, uh, copyright, and, and especially with the James Joyce estate, which is notoriously um, aggressive about protecting its copyrights, which is hugely ironic given uh, Joyce's <laughs> occasional mode of appropriation in his own right. Um, <clears throat> so the, the problem with fair use is that its protection stop at the border of the United States. Um, and, you know, fair use is a local ordinance in a global information economy. Um, so so uh, publishers that, within, that publish within the United States um, that do make allowances for fair use, fairly liberal allowances, um, uh, run into problems when they try and publish those same books or license those books overseas and other territories. Um, and that leads me to uh, the content licensing issue, which is, um, you know, as our world becomes increasingly globalized um, and, and commerce is interconnected, the, the various legal jurisdictions um, create all sorts of headaches for uh, license, uh, drafting reasonable and fairly friction-free licensing agreements. I mean, let me just provide you an example, um, not from the book industry, but it, it <coughs> translates to the book industry very easily. I have a friend who uh, works at one of the three major legal um, music uh, uh, downloading services, like Apple, uh, I, you know, I, Apple iTunes and, and Rhapsody and uh, eMusic. Well, anyway, <coughs> they, they had a four-hour meeting about whether or not a subscriber to their service who's uh, United States, who's based in the United States, but is in traveling in, for instance, Canada. Um, they had a four-hour conversation uh, around the table with five of their, you know, five members of the legal counsel and, and um, business team, but primarily the legal people, about whether or not a United States user who's in Toronto can access 
their music service uh, while you know they're not in the country? And the ultimate answer was no. It's too. <laughs> it, it's just impossible to draft that sort of license, uh, or that is to get record companies to agree on that. So in other words, basically. There were four or five people who are making probably you know two to three hundred dollar billable hours per hour, basically eating up all this money, and none of that money goes to the authors. <laughs> this is an example of uh, the friction um, that occurs that is not advantageous to, for instance, authors, uh, where basically there's money being uh, traded back and forth. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's among the people who make two to three hundred dollars an hour, and that money cuts into your the, the business's bottom line, whether you're a book publisher or uh, a record company or or um, music a downloading service. <clears throat> so, uh, lastly, I just wanted to talk about uh, publishing contracts, also, um, and I'm coming at this from the perspective of a scholar who um, wants his work to be as widely disseminated as possible. Um, there are actually two things I want to address. One is, uh, and they're interrelated, one, and I'm going to quickly wrap up with this. <clears throat> First, in order to get tenure, you have to publish in journals, reputable journals, that almost always ask you to give up your copyright, sign away your copyright to uh, your work. And in the past, you know, there's in, in the past that was basically the norm. These uh, journals were typically run by uh, uh, the societies, like, you know, Society for Cinema Studies or whatever. Uh, they've since been outsourced to large companies like Taylor and Francis. So, you know, back then there was this term, you know, a contribution to the field. And you're literally kind of donating your work to the field and your society that publishes the journal is the steward of that, that work. Uh, nowadays, it doesn't work that way. And so you end up with a situation where authors don't own the rights, uh, have the rights to their own work. Sometimes they end up having to re-purchase uh, the right from the journal to include a modified version of an article within a book that they're uh, working on. Um, so that's a real issue. And then the last, um, yeah, the last thing is just what? what, what, what um. Thank you so much. And yeah, there are so many topics. <laughs> and I think there are people, there are questions in the audience. So let's start with those. And then as, as they evolve, then we can maybe show them a little bit more. But are there some burning, are there some burning issues that people feel that they would like to take up immediately? Please. Hi, my name is Rachel. So, Professor McLeod, I saw your independent uh, lens documentary, and um, what struck me was that in the section of time when sampling was permitted, um, it seems like there's a large parallel between that uh, flurry of activity, of, of, um, of artistic activity, and Professor Valentino, what you were talking about, the, um, the translations going on now. And I wondered if you could speak to the parallels between those two. Well, I'll just quickly set it set it up and pitch it to Russell, just I'll for catch. people in the room who don't know the background. I did this documentary called Copyright Criminals, which is a history of uh, digital sampling and remix culture over the past 25 years or so. And um, in the 1980s, hip hop was seen as a uh, underground uh, thing, or it was just seen as a passing fad. And it was hip hop artists who were the first to who brought sound collage into popular music. I mean, it had existed, sound collage had existed in the avant-garde for years, John Cage, et cetera, um, Stockhausen. But um, it was hip-hop artists who started remixing old records um, and, um, and, and inserted the collage aesthetic into popular music. And so, yeah, there was a lot of elbow room during this time because they were being ignored. Sort of like how the modernists were probably being ignored, but I think I mean, well, I don't know if you wanted to pick up yeah. the connection. So, um, yeah, I think that there there is definitely a parallel. Um, my my impression is that at this point, it's it's not so much the rules as the is as the very complexity of the rules that are putting the constraints on the exchange of art forms and ideas, and so at least by legal means, that's that's the that's the. That's the key part. There, there are lots of things being exchanged illegally, and it's mostly through the internet, mostly. Uh, and a lot of ideas, a lot of 
sample works, a lot of that is happening. Um, it's just ha happening under the table. Um, and so it's that, that complexity part, though, that's the, that's the, that's, it seems to me, the crux. If things can be simplified <laughs> somehow, uh, that would help a lot. Um, that's what I mean by friction in these transactions. Yeah. It just becomes, yep. it's so it easy very to cover wasteful. a song, right? So during the 20th century, the, form, the art form of the cover song thrived. In fact, the majority of records released by all labels through the 20th century were covers of other people's songs. And it was so simple, so easy. And so that art form, you know, the art of the cover song thrived, whereas digital sampling by 1989, 1990 just got shut down. Uh, and, and, you know, it still exists, but economically speaking, it um, made it possible, uh, it, economically speaking, or the economics of, of licensing made it so that the more kind of uncreative, unoriginal forms of sampling, which is just taking a hook from an old song, rather than doing what Public Enemy did, um, the hip hop group Public Enemy, which would sample from 25, 30 different sources, sound sources, not always musical sources, just sound sources to construct a song. That mode of collage um, went out the window and the economics favored the simplicity of just dealing with one copyright owner when you're sampling. Can, can I add just a little bit? This, this really, this uh, it comes into Jim's domain because that, the, as part of the simplification, it, it, there should be some clarity about what Granier was talking about, the length of the term of comp copyright. That is one of the things that's hugely divergent from one place to another. Uh, and so you don't know if it's seven years, if it's 14 years, if it's 70 years after the death of the author, if the heirs have extended it, what have you. I mean, you just never know. And so that is extremely, extremely complicated. If it's simplified and reduced, that in turn will have an effect on the way that publishers have traditionally operated by having a backlist. A backlist that is worth some money. Uh, traditionally, publishers actually did pretty well by keeping a backlist, keeping their titles there for a long time, and just selling as they needed to. Um, well, if, they, if those things then go into the public domain after a very clear but not excessive length of time, that practice actually probably already has changed a great deal, but it would need to be modified a, a lot. You'd have to find a different business model in right. effect. To add to that, I, in, in scholarly publishing, the backlist is everything. Uh, that's how you pay your bills. Um, because it gains currency through time as these academic arguments uh, gain currency and, and, and come to fruition and are taught and um, it often takes several years for that for a book uh, that initially maybe in in market terms was not that successful to really find a home and I, I think you hit the nail on the head it's the complexity of everything it you know a press like ours and I think this is true of a lot of um, smaller tier university presses we're we're running on the leanest of margins. We don't have, um, we certainly have access to deputy counsel at the university, but the decisions <coughs> we're making day to day, moment to moment, we don't have legal counsel on staff. Um, and, and we're making these decisions every single day. And uh, we're doing so at the best of our ability, but as Kimber pointed out, I mean, the threat of being, the penalty uh, that could extend from being sued is just so extensive and astronomical. It could knock a, a publisher like ours out of business very quickly. Um, and I, I think that because of the complexity, you're often shrugging your shoulders and saying, I think I understand, but you know, uh, I'm a little afraid to sign off on it. And we, more than any other time I can remember, in, I've been involved in scholarly publishing for over 15 years. It's become, uh, every day has become a struggle over uh, contracts and legalities and copyright, uh, much more so than it was 10, 15 years ago. So. With respect, to the international problem, my husband, uh, my name is Serena, recently found out that from a Chinese scholar that some 15,000 copies of one of his books were in circulation in China. Um, and he didn't care so much about the loss of the income. But as Professor Valentino pointed out, 
who knows what that translation says? Um, you know, there, yeah. there was no opportunity to be, you know, to give advice on it and to be responsive to it. Um, and that's, that's troubling uh, because you want your work to continue to look coherent in whatever language it might be presented. Yeah. So, I well, I, I, think that's, I think that's interesting because it extends to another issue, which is not just translation, but the quality of the book or the quality of the design, or, and particularly when you're dealing with poetry, which you deal with all the time. Who knows? I mean, and this isn't even pirating. This is just translating to a, a new vendor uh, who, in a new mobile device, a new electronic device. Who knows what it's going to look? And, and rarely will you find in these contracts any sort of quality control. Um, and if you ask for it, you will be denied. It, it just doesn't, I mean, one thing I'll say for Google Books is, is they've worked hard on that uh, and have allowed you some kind of uh, quality control access. But Amazon or some of the others, uh, you need to buy that work and vet it on your own time. Um, they're not going to show it to you in advance. So. No? No. <laughs> This is, a, this is sort of a comment rather than a question. I'm hoping somebody can sort of take this in the realm of it. One of the great economists of the 20th century was a guy named Ronald Coase. I don't know if he's still around. Um, he was at Chicago for decades. Uh, he didn't write a lot, but he wrote on, um, uh, he wrote a lot about property rights and how property, if I understand correctly, property rights the ownership of resources will, in the end, end up in the hands of the agent, a person, firm, whoever, who can get the most value out of them. Um, hmm. Property rights don't. The property rights don't stay in the hands of the people who, um, who originally have them. They go to the. They go to the agent who values them the most, almost independently of mm -hmm. where they start out. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm hoping somebody who I'll jump in real about quick. price theory more can learn this thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, first, uh, yeah, <clears throat> there are a lot of analogies between intellectual property and physical property, but the two are not the same thing. They're, you know, uh, you know first of all, intellectual property is non-rivalrous. In other words, I can, you know, I steal your car, you don't have a car. Um, you know, I steal your ebook or whatever, and there, there are multiple copies. There, um, intellectual property is non-rivalrous, and so actually, I think the example of orphan works, uh, which you'd mentioned earlier, that is books who are that are still under copyright but don't, uh, for various reasons, are just not commercially available. Um, whether it's because it was yeah. on a small independent press that went bankrupt and. 1940 and then its assets got transferred to a bank which then swallowed up another bank or whatever. The, so the, the example of orphan works sort of contradicts that assertion, right? Uh, because uh, the, just because so, you know, someone has been assigned copyrights uh, does not mean that they're gonna um, generate value out of it or even uh, circulate it in the marketplace. Oh, also I saw on Twitter earlier this morning, I had to pull this up, um, someone uh, this actually is a kind of a counter example of your Kindle price point where, you know, typically the Kindle price point is under what a hard copy uh, or hardcover is. And so it was um, hardcover was six ninety nine, uh, paperback seven ninety five, <laughs> Kindle nine ninety nine. And the irony the irony is the title of this book is Economics and One Lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>